An Auburn man who was injured after falling 80 feet down a rock cliff this weekend says reports that he was not prepared are not true. 24-year-old Aaron Shabbat suffered multiple injuries and a concussion while free climbing on Tumbledown Mountain near Weld. Just had some, some bad luck, happens to everybody. Uh, my rock uh, that I was using as a toe grip, all I had to do was just pull myself up, hoist my, my uh, uh, hips over, and face myself, and, and I was there. And it didn't exactly work out the way I was hoping. The rock came out of my hands, and all of a sudden I was falling face down the mountain. I think a lot of people, when they look at me, it's really easy to say, oh, he's a mountain man or whatever. And that's kind of crap because it's just a, it's a small part of who I am. It's not the majority of who I am or, or what it is to be me. Another thing that really bothers me, a lot of people, when they hear about the accident and everything before and after, you know, that weekend, the climb, and the mentality of free climbing and then being stranded up there for so long, and the rescue. And, I mean, it's kind of a trippy story, sure, but a lot of people, because it's something that's like ripped right out of a Hollywood screenplay or something, a lot of people, when they hear that story, they kind of throw me in this box where, well, that's the dude that fell off the map. And that really kind of bothers me, so much so that I don't really talk about it or share that story with too many people anymore, because whenever they see me, they're like, oh, that's the dude with no teeth. He lost his teeth falling off the mountain. That's the first thing that comes to their mind anytime they see me or they see any of my you know, photography or they read any of my uh, writings or short stories or see any of my paintings. Yeah, it's a part of me, but I don't want that to be at the forefront of, of everybody's mindset when they look at who I am or the work I produce. So last fall around Thanksgiving, I really decided I wanted to paint. I'd never really painted before, except a little bit maybe in seventh grade or when I was in school in Paris pretending to be a communist renaissance man, impress all the ladies. So I, I decided I wanted to paint, and the easiest thing to paint was the world around me. Unfortunately, working in an office doesn't really give me a whole lot of inspiration. Um, so I started painting or drawing inspiration for my paintings from a lot of my different hikes and different climbs. Since Thanksgiving, I've been going to Death Valley quite a bit. The painting of Surprise Canyon is one of the more artistic interpretations of a photograph. It really just tries to incorporate like the different, like all the greenery and then the aspen trees and like the reeds that are sprouting up everywhere and all the colors of fall and everything else. Um, all kind of thrown into one big tangled mess that you have to fight through as you're walking up there. The picture of Lake Manly and Telescope Peak, I've always really, really dug the photo just because of the colors and the lines and just the history behind the photo. I mean, Lake Manly only appears every 500 years or so. So to be there and take the picture was a pretty cool experience, but then to turn around and try to put all the emotion and, and capture the feeling of everything that went into that trip to Death Valley and the lake and everything else, to try to put that on a piece of canvas with paint, I was really attracted to the challenge behind it. Truck door is kind of what started it all. Uh, I was out in this quasi ghost town called Darwin, and I saw this beat up old truck just kind of dumped in the middle of town. And the paint on the door had just been rubbed away by years and years and years of sun and dirt and swirling sand, and it just carved this incredibly awesome 
like mosaic into the truck door. So I took a picture of it and I brought it home and tried to paint. And that's where I got the idea of sanding, layering all the paint and everything else. A lot of what I paint is based on a photograph that I took during a hike or a walk. There are a couple different reasons for that. First and foremost, when I started thinking about painting, I saw this really cool rusted out truck. And the patterns in the door were just really trippy. I really wanted to paint that, so always having my camera around when I hike, I just automatically snapped the picture. Hi, how's it going? How are ya? Oh. You got old Death Valley yet? Or? What's that? Have you got been over to Death Valley yet? No, not yet. Yeah, if you want to camp, just camp anywhere down in there or Perfect. wherever, you know. It's just, they charge like two bucks a night to camp and go over there. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, you got a tent and all that with you? Ah, uh, no, we're just going to sleep on the ground. Oh, it might get a little cold. Yeah. It'd be warmer down here probably than it would be up there. You know. The Manson Mobile. It's <laughs> a nice old Jeep. Yeah. The Manson Mobile, this piece took me a long time to complete. I kept having to repaint it and repaint it and repaint it. The colors just wouldn't come out quite right. But basically it's based on Charles Manson's Jeep that he left at Ballarat. What really inspires me about being active and outside I don't know if there's a specific thing really that you can kind of put your finger on. I've always been like that, so for me it's just continuing with my normal lifestyle. Growing up in Maine, as a kid you do a lot of outdoorsy stuff, four seasons year round, hiking, playing in the woods, fishing, camping, what have you. In the winter time we'd go down to the pond and skate or play hockey. You're always outside, just because I'm growing up and I have to work. 50 or 60 hours a week in an office doesn't mean I want to spend my entire life indoors. Working is just a means to an end. Outside is where I grew up, where I belong. It's where I feel comfortable, where I feel free. Most people think I'm absolutely freaking nuts. Like, no doubt about it, crazy. And they have for the majority of my life. My friends and family especially, like close friends and family, um, don't really get it. For me, I'm not doing anything that I consider crazy. I mean, every now and again, sure. Uh, but for the most part, this is just life for me. 
and it's tr it, it is kind of difficult to explain to someone exactly what's going on in my life when they're from an entirely different you know, social or, or cultural background with that set of values or with that mentality. The pure joy I get climbing up a cliff face that maybe no one has climbed in a year or and looking out over a valley and seeing the sunrise or, or to the wind through the trees, something like that, to me is amazing and beautiful. But try to explain that to somebody who has never been outside of little their little white picket fences in suburbia. It's night and day. It's like trying to, you know, talk to a Martian. I've really been going to Death Valley a lot the last couple months for a number of different reasons. The history there is incredible. There's so many different stories. There's so many crazy things um, that have happened there in the last hundred years or so. And Death Valley in and of itself, I mean, just the name is so desolate and lonely. A lot of the national parks, you know, especially in, in Arizona and Southern California, Central California, totally overcrowded with, you know, retired folks and RVs and all sorts of crap. And Death Valley really isn't like that. There's a lot of places you can just escape to. So that's what the last couple of months has really attracted me to Death Valley. Just go out there and you can just relax and be alone and enjoy the solitude of nature, or as Edward Abbey used to call it, the desert solitaire. I kind of stumbled upon the cabin in Panamint City. First time I went up there, I had no idea if it was actually still going to be standing or what to expect when I got up there. I like going up there and staying at the cabin because, well, let's face it, I'm getting a little older, a little fatter, <laughs> a little lazier. So it's nice to be able to have a roof above your head instead of just throwing out a sleeping bag on you know, the cold earth. Not that I don't do that every now and again, but it's nice after a really long walk just to have a, a warm, comfortable place to crash. So that's a, a huge benefit. High in vitamin C, baby. Nippy weather.
Go check the temperature. Let's see how it's holding up. My favorite thing about being outside is how everything slows down and how simple life itself becomes. You don't have to worry about cell phones or traffic or voicemail or emails or angry clients calling or landlords telling you your rent is late, your car being repossessed. You don't have to worry about any of that crap. Time slows down and the only thing that's really important is just life itself. When you're outside, or when I'm outside anyhow, the simple things in life that you absolutely have to do, which a lot of people would consider work, which if I was in the city doing the same things or going through the same process, I would consider work and definitely wouldn't appreciate it. Those same things all of a sudden when you're in the wilderness are incredibly enjoyable, like um, having to build a fire to make breakfast when it's... 20 degrees below zero that's a real pain in the butt but at the same time you can take away a very simple joy from having done that or chopping down a tree if i was in the city and someone told me to go chop down a tree i'd be like are you kidding me chop it down yourself but when you're outside and you have all day to chop down that tree and you know that your the very essence of your survival depends on you cutting down that one tree and being able to burn it for the next couple of days it's still a pain in the butt, but it's an enjoyable pain in the butt. You know, we're going fishing or whatever. You know, all of a sudden, just the simple things are cool. Telescope Peak. What interests me most about the peak itself is that it's bloody huge and it's so prominent and sticks out in the middle of everything. And you are you can stand in Badwater Basin, you know, two or three hundred feet below sea level and just look up at this immense peak and you just want to climb it, you just want to run up there. Of course you can't. Um, or I can't anyhow. But the desire is still there. You know, let's not let's not kid ourselves. Um, when I'm hiking, there's very, very little about the act itself that I like. I mean, seriously, I freaking hate hiking. At times, I hate being outdoors. But when it's over, you know, when you get to the end of the day and you get to see that amazing sunset, or you, you're finally on top of the mountain, you're looking out over 
this incredible vista, all of a sudden, all the crap that you hate about hiking, you know, tiredness and having two tons of crap on your back, all that just goes away. And when you light that fire and you just kind of settle in for the night, you know, get a nice hot mug of tea or something like that. It's really easy to focus on the romantic uh, side of the ordeal. And you kind of forget about all the crap you went through to get up there. So I think that's probably what I enjoy the most. The first hundred feet were horrible. I thought I was going to cough out a lung. But then, you know, you take like two, three hundred feet going straight up a scree field. It busts in your muscles pretty good, gets you warmed up gets you breathing nice and hard it's tough to pick up a pace you know like a steady rhythm because your body's just going everywhere and it's hard to like find solid ground where you can just pound away but uh i started feeling pretty good after about four or five hundred feet uh right after that we must have hit i mean if i had to guess maybe like 7500 feet and after that i could really start feeling like every breath of air we're not really that high up and every breath of air it's just like there's a little less o2 all the way up now i'm feeling pretty good but man just the smallest thing you start huffing and puffing Doctors say I probably shouldn't be doing this. Uh, with the accident, I had one lung that was totally collapsed. The other one was working its way down. Both of them were punctured by all these fragments of uh, rib bone that was just kind of like shotgun shells blown through the lungs. So now my lung capacity is about 40, 45% of a normal 30 year old adult male. Kind of see a way up through the ridge line. Just keep following this down and kind of cut to the left of the precipice and then right on up to the shoulder and call it good. But we're about a half hour past our cutoff time already. So I think just uh, just for safety's sake, um, I think I'm gonna have to head down. It's a beautiful day out. I really don't want to. It, the, the peak's right there. One thing's for certain though, it's going to be a beautiful sunset up here. What is my story? Shit dude, I don't think I have a story. Which is kind of funny because I'll be the first one to tell you that everybody out there has a story. It's just waiting for the right person to figure out the best way to tell it. But me? <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, I'm just doing my own thing, going about life. Trying to get through tomorrow. I guess there's a story in there somewhere.